you know, sometimes you just have to commit to the idea that everyone in the world watched a different football game than you did, and that would be my message to anyone that thought that Monday night or last night was this great football game, and that was one of the sloppiest games I've ever seen. Kind of took it on the chin in week one, let's talk about it. What's happening, everybody? Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees, and welcome to week two of my weekly NFL football pick show for the 2021-2022 NFL regular season and postseason. And yeah, things were kind of rough. Like, look, even if you only have listened to me since last week, which I know I got some new viewers off of week one, you know that the rule of four is a thing. I talked to you about it yesterday. I don't think anybody called the rule of nine. Nine betting underdogs winning their games straight up in week one is absolutely astronomical and uh, not something that I called. Only five and 11 straight up, which is never, ever, ever going to be good enough. The betting numbers were at least a little bit better than that. Uh, six, nine, and one against the spread. So that's at least a little bit better than five and 11. Almost went even money on the totals at 7 and 9. We're underwater across the board. It's a slow start, but that's okay. Obviously, we have a ton of room to uh, right that ship, and we have the extra week compared to other seasons as well. Platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks, as you can see in front of you now. I did go 3 and 1 straight up on those picks. I mean, Minnesota absolutely torpedoed me in the platinum pick, but, you know, sometimes that happens. 3 and 1 straight up, 3 and 1 against the spread, which I feel particularly proud of Dallas plus 7.5. I kind of pegged that right from the start, so I feel proud about that. Kind of gave it back on the totals, only going 1 and 3. The pick em pools, obviously things are not looking great because I didn't do very well uh, really across the board in week one. I will kind of take a second to point out the Half Moon's ATS pool where I am at least still in the top quarter of things because confidence points are my bag. But I mean, look, in my pool, 26th place, there's only 28 people in that pool. The Anti and Co League, 21st place, there's only 22 people in that pool. So obviously, things not going well for me there. I did survive through week one of the uh, Anti and Co Survival Pool. There are two teams in that pool now with one strike. I took the Rams in week one. That definitely worked out. I want to shout out in the Bridgewater's Finest Pick'em Pool, Teddy Ted, who went 10 and 6, 95 of 136 possible confidence points. That's a clip of 69.9%. Nice. And that was good enough to win week one and have the overall lead. And in the Half Moon's Picks pool, I want to shout out Crash, who came from behind on Monday night, one of the few people that had the Raiders against the spread, and he clutched victory from the claws of defeat in week one, going 10-6 and six against the spread, 93 of 136 possible confidence points, that's 68.4%. He won week one, he's the overall leader in the Half Moon's pool. In the Ante and Co pool, it's Rams fan 412. They had it outright with a couple of games left to go, I believe, straight up, going 11 and 5 in week one. That's 68.8%. That was good enough to win week one and be the overall leader. So shout out again to Teddy Ted, Crash, and Rams fan 412 for winning week one and being our out of the gate overall leaders so obviously as we can see here plenty of room to improve on things moving forward and we can certainly extend that into Fantasy Corner as well, which is, of course, presented by the Dynasty Trade Calculator, one of the absolute best, if not the absolute best, resources for Dynasty, Keeper, and long-term fantasy football. You're talking about trade evaluations, rankings, podcasts. It doesn't matter how your league is aligned. You can have super flexes. You can have tight end premiums, running back points per carry. Doesn't matter how your league is aligned. In fact, you can even import leagues directly depending on which platform you use. 
doesn't matter how you're aligned the dynasty trade calculator has got you covered in all facets to improve your team and improve your chances at bringing home dynasty fantasy football championships like yours truly plans beginning as low as three dollars with the dynasty trade calculator check my affiliate link which is in the description below but I took it on the chin in the first week of fantasy football as well, which I got to take a second and point out. And I put this on Twitter. The, the people taking these victory laps in fantasy football in week one, because they were like, well, I told you about Juwan Johnson or like, Hey, I, I said, I said, this player was going to struggle and look, he struggled, pat myself on the back. Like I'm Barry Horowitz in the nineties, like taking these victory laps after week one. It's one week of a 14 to 16, 17 week, maybe even fantasy football season. You can take your victory laps now, but like keep that energy eight weeks from now when your team is two and six and your preseason hot take is either on IR or on your bench. That's all I'm saying. So in saying that I'm one in five <laughs> across my six fantasy football teams, the only league that I won in was I believe our redraft league on sleeper. Uh, yeah, one in five, certainly not the way you want to start. But what I will say is apparently I should have been playing best ball like years ago. Because I had a pretty solid week in week one in best ball. I got two best ball leagues, as you will remember. Hopefully, I'm in fifth place and second place in those two best ball leagues after week one. So maybe I should have invested in some best ball earlier in my fantasy career. In the Professionals Dynasty League, I lost to uh, Anthony Cormier in week one, starting things off 0-1. That matchup was not particularly, well, I mean, that one was certainly closer than the Progs League one, but I start off 0-1 in that league. I got a week two matchup coming up against Keith, Beetle Bailey, a longtime member of this Progs community. In the Progs Fantasy Football League, I lost to Bone Crushers. That matchup was not close. And boy, is that league ever going to be a struggle for me this year, I think. I got a Week 2 matchup against Half Moon's Picks. Of course, the proprietor of the Half Moon's Against the Spread Pool, where he's giving away a bunch of his own money this year. That's also a projected loss for me. So I'm going to struggle in this league. I think I got plenty of work to do across the board in Fantasy Football heading into Week 2. And I'll take this opportunity to remind you, as I always do, that if you go to the description of the video and audio file on YouTube, SoundCloud, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts of choice, you are going to find all of my results from last week, all of my straight up against the spread and over under plays for week two in the NFL. You're going to find information on joining all of those pools that I mentioned earlier, the Bridgewater's Finest straight up pick'em pool, the Half Moon's Picks Against the Spread pick'em pool, and the Anti and Co pick'em pool, as well as I think you can even still sign up for the survival pool, although I may be wrong about that. You can find information on joining the NFL YouTube Prognosticators Facebook page, and you can find information on my great friends and sponsors at Nerd Tees. Folks, only one thing pulls you out of the dour mood of going 5-11 and 11 and 1-5 and five in fantasy in week one, and that is a delicious cup of Nerd Tees. NerdTees.ca, and with my promo code BWFINEST, you can save yourself 15% at checkout. Get free shipping in Canada on any order over 100 bucks, and there's, again, an incredible, incredible uh, conversion rate on the U.S. dollar for all of my listeners south of the border today's blend is a classic amaretto almond biscotti and i had the idea earlier and i may do this at the end of the season to go back since the beginning of my nerd tees sponsorship and go back and see based on tea blend under which tea blend is my record the best because i, I may have to start drinking that tea blend more Amaretto Almond Biscotti. I've been drinking this blend in particular for years. Very smooth, smells great, has an excellent taste, and it is one of just dozens and dozens of incredible tea blends and accessories that you can find on nerdtees.ca. Promo code BWFINEST. Get your free shipping. Save your 15%. Find yourself something to love or find someone you love something to love. You can do it on nerdtees.ca. If you're sensing that the pace is quickened here, that is definitely by design. Let's take a look at the week two picks 
Let's kick things off in week two in Washington, where the football team is going to play host to NFC East rival, the New York Giants. Both of these teams on the unhappy side of their results last week, Washington dropping a decision against the Chargers, the Giants getting pretty well controlled by the Denver Broncos. Uh, news, of course, continues to get bad for Washington as they suffered one of the significant injuries coming out of week one, and that is quarterback Ryan Fitzpatrick. He suffered a hip subluxation. He is heading to injured reserve. That's a six to eight week timeline at the age that Ryan Fitzpatrick is at, there are serious questions about whether he can come back at all this year. That is certainly a situation to keep an eye on, but it looks like it's going to be Taylor Heineke's team moving forward. Washington, I don't think quite as good as I thought they were coming out of the preseason. Again, I thought this was one of the most improved teams in the league, and I certainly thought they had enough to handle the Chargers last week. Chargers, I think, are about what they were. Giants, I think, are about what they are. But I, th those are two very different football teams. Obviously, the quality of competition is dropping down this week if you are Washington. I really like the football team in this matchup. I didn't see much of anything from the Giants that overly impressed me. A lot of the same problems. And look, if Saquon Barkley's not 100%, this offense is not going to be 100%, even for the Giants, which is obviously less than 100% for a lot of other teams. We're going to go with the football team in this matchup. Let's take Washington at home to beat the Giants. On the line, Washington is only laying three points as a home favorite. I like him to win. It's a relatively small price to pay where it's just the single field goal. So let's lay those three points on Washington. Total in the game set at 41. It's the lowest total of the week. But even so, I don't know what I'm going to get from the Giants offense. I think Sterling Shepard had a good game. But again, Daniel Jones showed that he, to this point, doesn't seem to have taken the step forward that I think they would have expected him to have taken now in what his third pro season, I think it is. Doesn't look like a third year or fourth year or however long he's been in the league now. Does not look like that quarterback. Still looks like he's making the same mistakes with the football, the same kind of nerves that he's been showing with the football. I just don't like what I'm seeing. Even if they get like a Kenny Galladay back, I just don't think I don't think you can put enough weapons on this team to make up for the fact that Saquon is not a hundred percent. So I I'm gonna go under on this one because I also don't know what I'm gonna get full time out of Taylor Heineke. I know Washington's got the weapons, but now do they have the quarterback to get it done? Time will tell. We're gonna lean under on this, even though it's the lowest total of the week, under 41 points in New York, Washington. Let's go football team 20, Giants 13. Let's go to Chicago now. Bears and Bengals. Chicago getting manhandled by Matthew Stafford in his LA Rams debut. Cincinnati pulling out the win against my platinum pick in Minnesota. And like, oh boy, the Vikings. We'll get to them. But that look, I, I was pleasantly surprised by Cincinnati. Seeing the way Joe Burrow can sling the football now that he's got some extra weapons. He was spreading the ball around. CJ Uzama even got some, uh, got some work in. And I think this Cincinnati team, this is kind of what I felt about them in the preseason. This Bengals team is going to be significantly better offensively. The defense, oh boy, I still don't know. And I think against a team that was less discombobulated in week one than the Minnesota Vikings, I think Cincinnati loses that game. I kind of like the Bengals here. Now, I realize Chicago certainly going to come in here considered the better team and not just because they're at home. I think this Bengals team has something. So this is an upset play just in the second pick we're going to talk about. But I like the Bengals in Chicago this week to put it on the Bears. Cincinnati comes out of Chicago with the win. On the line, the Bears are laying three points as a home favorite. I like Cincinnati to win outright. I'm more than happy to take those three points, going along with 66% of the public on covers. Total in the game set at 45 points. This was uh, this wasn't immediately obvious to me as far as I'm concerned. Like I, both of these teams went over last week, but they only went over their totals by a combined five and a half points. So it was marginal to say the least. But I think with a number like that, I think there's just way too many score combinations that hit over there. So we're going to lean over on the 45 points 
in Cincinnati, Chicago. Let's take Bengals 24, Bears 23. It might be a last second field goal, but I think the Bengals get it done. Let's go to Indianapolis now, Colts and Rams. The Colts definitely did not look like the team that I think a number of people hoped and expected that they would be. Boy, they did not look good against Seattle. And I understand the Seattle's a good football team, but you would have thought that the Colts would have been able to put up more than 16 points against a Seattle defense that most of last year, you could move the ball on them pretty easy and their scoring defense more than a little bit suspect. But that was not the case. They weren't able to score more than 16. They dropped a pretty convincing decision. The Rams, like I mentioned before, Matt Stafford looked great. In his Rams debut, he's got a ton of weapons on that team. This Rams team is better than I thought they were going to be coming out of the preseason. Obviously, you had to think, boy, this team's got to get better. They got Matt Stafford. Boy, that they looked like a well-oiled machine on both sides of the football, going up against a pretty good defense. Now, the Colts defense, I think, is not as good as the Bears. I think if I had to make that estimation, that's probably the side of that coin that I would fall on. I still don't think the Rams are going to have much of any problem moving the ball and putting up points. It's going to be a little bit different because they're not going to have the crowd on their side in this one. But this is two teams that I think are going in different directions. I'm going to take the team that is on the incline, and that is the LA Rams. Let's take the Rams on the road in Indianapolis to put another loss on the Colts. On the line, the Colts are four-point dogs at home, and I'm surprised that more people are not taking them. 75% of people on covers are laying the four points on the Rams. I think that's what I've got to do, too. It's not a crazy number. It's not up close to a touchdown. It's a little bit more than a field goal. I think I can comfortably lay those points on the team that I genuinely believe to be the better team. So we're going to lay the four points Total in the game set at 47 and a half points. Uh, this felt like an under to me the second I saw that number. I think this is like a mid to high 30. So I don't think this game gets into the 40 point range. We're going to comfortably grab the under on 47 and a half points. Two defenses that can play some football. Let's take Rams 24, Colts 13. Let's go to Miami now, another divisional matchup. The Dolphins playing host to the Buffalo Bills. Both of these teams about what I thought they were heading into last week. Yes, Buffalo did not pick up the win there against the Steelers. Steelers kind of just, Steelers did something special, I think, in the back half, back half of that football game. I'm not going to hold it too, too much against the Bills in that case. What did they lose that game by? I think it was... 23-16, I realized they were a big favorite, but, you know, things happen. The Dolphins picking up an impressive one-point win, a division win, 17-16 against the Patriots. I do think they're a better team, the Dolphins, than they were last year. It might be kind of marginal. Still seeing Tua make some mistakes with the football that I would hope that he wouldn't be making in his second year. Overall, I do think this is a better football team. This is, I think, going to be one of the more entertaining games of the week this week. I got to take the Bills, though. I, I, I just think the Bills are the better football team. I think the Bills are the class of this division. I think we're going to take Buffalo here on the road in Miami to move the Dolphins to 1-1 one and, one and even up their own record. On the line here, the Dolphins are three-point dogs at home, and I cannot blame a single person if they want to take those three points on the home dog in a division matchup. It's probably the smart play, but I don't think it's that great of a hedge, and I like Buffalo to win. If I really wanted to do that, I'd grab the Dolphins outright, but I don't think Miami wins the game. It's a relatively small price to pay on the team that I think is going to win, so I'm going to go along with 61% of the public, lay the three points on the Buffalo Bills. Total in the game set at 48, and I think this thing is well into the 50s by the end of it. So we're gonna grab over on the 48 points in Buffalo, Miami. Let's go Bills 31, Dolphins 27. Great football game. Let's go to Philly now where the Eagles both threw a combination of being better than I thought they were and facing competition in Atlanta that is worse than I thought they were, had a really impressive performance in week one. 
The Eagles put up 32 points on the Falcons defense and oh boy is that ever going to be a work in progress this season. Philly with a really impressive win. Defense played well. Jalen Hurts played well. Had both uh, Devonta Smith and Kenny Gainwell score their first touchdowns of their NFL careers. They are at home this week taking on the San Francisco 49ers who held on to beat Detroit in that game last week. An incredibly high scoring game. I believe it was 41 to 33 I think was the final score. And wouldn't you know who won the pony, 49ers and injuries. And unfortunately, it's on both sides of the football. Raheem Mostert for the 49ers at running back, injuring cartilage in his knee. He's headed to injured reserve. That's a six to eight week timeline for him. Looks like it's going to be some combination of everyone not named Trey Sermon for running back for the 49ers. And on the defensive side in their secondary, Jason Verrett, who is a big part of that pass defense, he tore his ACL. He is done for the year. So both sides of the ball, San Fran suffering a significant injury and they're on the tail end of back-to-back road games now last year i believe teams on the tail end of back-to-back roadies were 37 30 and one straight up i believe it was and 34 31 and three or something like that against the spread so they did have a little more success than i would expect them to it's still tough not only to play back-to-back games on the road but to start your season with back-to-back games on the road I like the Eagles here. They're the home dog. Uh, They really impressed me in week one. If they can chain any kind of performance like they had last week in back-to-back weeks, I think they pick up this win. Let's take the Eagles at home to beat the Niners. On the line, Eagles three and a half point dogs, like I mentioned. Now, 65% of the public are on the Niners to cover this number, but I like the Eagles to win outright, so I will happily take the three and a half points. Total in the game set at 50. I think this is somewhere in like a low to mid 40. I may feel a little better about it uh, if the Niners injuries didn't exist. I think we're going to stay under on this number. Let's go under 50 points in San Francisco, Philly. Let's take Eagles 23, Niners 20. Let's go to Pittsburgh now. Two teams on the happy side of par from week one. The Steelers picking up that win against Buffalo. This week playing host to the Las Vegas Raiders, who we just kind of mentioned. Winning that game in overtime last night on Monday Night Football. I still don't think this Raiders team is as good as they were last season. And I don't think that win convinced me otherwise. I think they were handed that win by the ineptitude of their opposition and boy there's some real questions to answer in baltimore moving forward no question about that that's not to take anything away from the raiders Derek carr had a really good game he threw for i think over 400 yards he got that win he put them in position where they could kick that field goal at the end of regulation to tie the game which by the way harbaugh you had a timeout freeze the kicker It was a 55-yard kick. Make him kick that twice. You can't exchange unused timeouts at the end of the year for more money. Like, you might as well use them. Raiders here obviously have to come in on the short week, and I genuinely think the Steelers are the better football team. They certainly showed me more than I thought they would show me early in the season. Their O-line looked a little bit better than I was expecting it to look against Buffalo's pass rush. I think Pittsburgh comes out here and picks up this victory. Let's take the Steelers at home to beat the Raiders. On the line, the Steelers are laying six points as a home favorite. This line originally gave me some trouble, and I really wasn't sure which way I wanted to lay on it. But again, I really think the Raiders got gifted many things in that football game last week. Not the least of which being uh, Tyson Williams had a really good first half, and then they didn't use him in the second half at all. So there were a lot of fortuitous bounces, I would say, for the Raiders in that game. I don't think the Raiders are the better team here. It's less than a touchdown. I think I'm going to lay those points on the Steelers, see their defense maybe come up huge in their home opener. Total in the game set at 47 and a half points. My original lean on this was to go over on it. The two teams split over and under last week. Last year, they were 20, 10, and 3 combined to the over. I think I'm fading my lean in this one, though. I'm going to lean more on the Steelers' defense to get this job done. So I think I'm going to stay just under 
the 47 and a half point total in Raiders Steelers. Let's go Pittsburgh 27, Raiders 20. Let's go to Carolina now, division matchup between the Panthers and the Saints, two teams that are probably a little bit better than I gave them credit for in the preseason. Carolina with a 19 to 14 win over the Jets in week one, looked fairly good in doing so. The Saints absolutely clobber and dominate my Green Bay Packers. Boy, were the Packers not ready to play, just didn't show up, like they didn't you might as well have stayed on the bus if that was the performance you were going to put out. Jameis Winston, five touchdown passes against the Packers. And I would have thought heading into this season, the secondary would be the strength on their defense, but uh, possibly not. So the Saints, for sure, a better team than I thought they were heading in. However, they did suffer a significant injury in that game, and it is to their new $100 million man in the secondary, Marshawn Lattimore. He had surgery on his thumb. He may have injured it signing his big contract. Who knows? Anyway, he is going to be out for a couple of weeks, and that absolutely changes the context of that Saints pass defense. Marshawn Lattimore does a lot of things and takes a lot of things away that allows the Saints to pinch and cheat and play a little better in other areas of their defense. Not having him on the field is a significant loss. Division matchup, home dog, anything can happen. Fire up the augmented reality Panther, folks. I like Carolina at home to get this win over the Saints. And no, it's not a revenge pick just because they beat the Packers. If you've been listening to me, you know I don't make picks like that. I genuinely think Carolina comes up with the upset here. That really, again, that injury changes that Saints defense. And I'm interested to see what Sam Darnold and the weapons he has available to him now what they can do now against that defense that's different, gonna be different than the one that we saw last week. Panthers get the upset win straight up. On the line, Carolina, plus three and a half at home against the Saints. 74% of the public are laying the points on New Orleans. So obviously we're going against that. I'm not scared, bring it on. I like the Panthers outright, so I'll take the three and a half points. Total in the game is set at 44 points. Both teams went under last week and they combined to be 19 and a half points under their totals. So I think we're going to stick under on this one again, under 44 points in Carolina, New Orleans. Let's go Panthers 23, Saints 20. Let's go to Jacksonville now. Jags playing host to the Denver Broncos. Two teams going in different directions from week one. And oh boy, does that Jags defense ever still stink. Jags get 37 points dropped on them by the Houston Texans, led by Tyrod T-Mobile Taylor. Woof. Kudos to Trevor Lawrence throwing his first three career NFL touchdowns. He also threw his first three career NFL interceptions. I would expect Trevor Lawrence to be better in this game. Now, of course, he's going to be playing a better defense, but I would expect him to be better here in week two. Denver, a really impressive win in week one, a win I didn't think they were going to get. I took the Giants. They better than double them up 27 to 13. I think the offense looked pretty darn good. The defense looked solid, although they didn't have to be up against a 100% Saquon Barkley. Maybe the context of the game would be different. However, a couple of things going against the Broncos here. They are on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. They got to go down to Florida. That's a long trip and suffering a significant injury to that deep wide receiver core, and that is Jerry Judy. Jerry Judy with a high ankle sprain, currently no timetable for his return. So they'll be moving forward with, of course, Cortland Sutton. They've got KJ Hamler in there as well. Look, they got Tim Patrick. This Broncos receiving core is good, but without Jerry Judy, it does change the context once again. Paging James Robinson, please God show up in this game. I'm going to take the Jags. Look, and the Jags are not as good as I thought they were coming out of the preseason. The Broncos may arguably be better than they were coming out of the pre, or that I thought they were anyway coming out of the preseason. But with that injury and the back-to-back -back road games, I'm going to lean on the Jags here. They're a pretty significant home underdog, but I'm going to take them to win this game outright. How much of a home underdog? The Broncos are laying six points. Uh, no. <laughs> this is not the team to lay six points on. You lay six points on the Steelers because you know they're a good football team. 
maybe Seattle, who you're pretty confident is a good football team, but you don't lay six points on the Broncos. Now this is going against 73% of the public, but since I like Jacksonville to win outright, I'll take the six points. Total in the game set at 45 and a half. They split the difference on the total last week, one going over, one going under. They were even money, 16 and 16 over under last year. They were both eight and eight because of course they were. My lean here is over because that's such a middling number. So many combinations that get over 45 and a half. So we will go ahead and grab over 45 and a half points in Denver, Jacksonville. We're gonna go Jags 26, Denver 23. Go to Arizona now, one of the most impressive teams coming out of week one, the Arizona Cardinals in a big bad way. They got a huge win over Tennessee. They were underdogs in that matchup. I was pretty confident that they were gonna win it. I didn't think they were gonna win it by 25 points. A big offensive showing, a stout defensive showing against Derrick Henry and the Tennessee Titans. Minnesota, who boy, stunk it up. Big bad stinkies against the Cincinnati Bengals, a team that there is almost no reason on paper why they shouldn't beat. I don't like their prospects. They're not as good, the Vikings, as I thought they were coming out of the preseason and into week one. They're also on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games. I'm taking Arizona here. There is nothing that I saw in that Arizona game that makes me think that they can't beat the Vikings in Arizona's own building. So we're on the Cardinals here, real heavy around these parts. Arizona beats Minnesota. On the line, Arizona laying four and a half points as a home favorite. I'm going to go along with 76% of the public here and lay those four and a half points on the cards. Total in the game set at 51. I think the one thing that these two teams can definitely do is score some points. I think Minnesota figures out their offensive issues. They put up their points. I just think Arizona puts up significantly more. We are going to go over 51 points in Arizona, Minnesota. Let's go Cards 37, Vikings 30. Big high scoring game. Lots of exciting football. Cards get the win. Off to LA now where the Chargers are going to play host to the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas on the long week, of course, having played in the Thursday night season opening game. That loss to Tampa Bay, very close loss. And Dallas looked really good on the offensive side. Yes, they're going to be without Michael Gallup for a few weeks. But I don't think that cripples their offense. He's very clearly the third guy. It's not like CeeDee Lamb or Amari Cooper or Zeke Elliott getting hurt. The Chargers did what they had to do. They got the win against Washington. I think it was 20 to 16. I didn't think they looked phenomenal, but they got the job done. So they're, they're about what I thought they were. Cowboys are on the tail end of back-to-back -back road games here, but they really impressed me, especially offensively against Tampa Bay. That defense definitely going to be a work in progress. This may turn out to be a little bit of a shootout, but I think Dallas gets the job done here, despite, of course, the back-to-back -back road games leaning against them. We know teams can win on the tail end of back-to-back -back roadies. We saw it last year. I like the Cowboys to go into LA and get this win. Dallas beats the Chargers. On the line, Chargers are laying three points as a home favorite. And part of this too, I'm so gun shy on the LA Chargers. They're one of those teams that God, I can never pick right when I think they're going to win. And they're almost always laying like two and a half or three points as a favorite. They almost never get the job done. When I think they're going to be an upset play, they get blown out. When I don't think they're going to cover it, they cover massively. So it's, they're just one of those teams that I almost can never get right. So sorry for Cowboys fans because I may be putting the hex on you here. But uh, I like Dallas plus three, as do 66% of the public. Of course, I like them to win outright, so I will take the points. Total in the game set at 55. Now this is the biggest total of the week. These two teams split over and under last week. They were 18 and 14 to the over last year, which is at least a slight lean to the over, which is what I leaned originally. I'm actually going to fade my own lean here, kind of like I did in Raiders and Steelers. I'm going to stay under on this number just because I, there's a couple of things here that I saw offensively with the Chargers. Maybe it was because they were playing a really good defense in Washington. There are a couple of offensive things with the Chargers, a couple of mistakes that you don't like to see. I don't think it's by a ton, but I think this game stays under. So we're going to stay under 55 points in Dallas, LA. Let's go Cowboys 28, Chargers 24.
Let's go to Seattle now. Seahawks playing host to the Tennessee Titans. Two teams very much going in opposite directions. Seattle, a little bit better than I thought they were going to be coming out of the preseason. Tennessee, definitely measurably worse. I get that you lost Corey Davis and Jonu Smith. I get that this offense looks different. But you brought in Julio frigging Jones. And you have one of the top three to five running backs in football in Derrick Henry. And you're going to go out and score 13 points against the Cards? Don't think that's going to cut it. Don't think it's going to cut it that Chandler Jones fed you your lunch to the tune of five quarterback sacks, I think, all on his own. That offensive line is scary. Not very good. Maybe it was just a terrible performance for Tennessee. That is entirely possible that it was just like, who the stinkiest performance you're going to see from them all year. But now you got to go into Seattle. Not that Seattle is this world beater, but the Seattle crowd certainly is. That home environment for the Seahawks is one of the loudest and most difficult to play in. It's like the biggest, one of the biggest home field advantages in all of football. And you're playing a Seahawks team that is better than you thought they were. So I, look, I'm on Seattle in this one. I think the Seahawks get this win. I don't think it's a massive blowout like Tennessee suffered last week, but I'm going to take the team on the incline. That's the Seahawks. On the line here, Seattle's laying five and a half points at home against Tennessee. And I think I got a hedge here. I like Seattle to win, but I think I'm going to take those five and a half points. I am going against 61% of the public in doing that. The, the possibility certainly exists here for Seattle to turn around and lay an egg and Tennessee to get this win. I think I'm just going to take those five and a half points and kind of cross my fingers a little bit. Total in the game here for Seattle, Tennessee is set at 53 and a half points. It is one of our biggest totals of the week. And actually, when I told you that Dallas and the Chargers were uh, the biggest total of the week, I was actually wrong. That's the game we're going to talk about next. But 53 and a half here for Tennessee and Seattle. They split over and under last week. I think I'm going to lean on the fact that they were 2013 and one combined to the over last year. And these two teams would have combined to have a lot of big numbers with the points that Tennessee was putting up and the points that Seattle were putting up. Their defenses, neither one of them were stellar. So the fact that they were still 20 and 13 to the over there. I think I got to feel at least decent about this number going over 53 and a half points. Let's go Seattle 30, Tennessee 27. And the last game we're going to look at before we get into the platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week two is the Baltimore Ravens on the short week. They get to go home, but they got to play host to the defending AFC champs, the Kansas City Chiefs, who held on to get the job done last week against Cleveland the Browns were my upset pick, but hey, they did cover against the spread, so kudos to them. Apologies, by the way, for the fridge in the background. Casey and Baltimore, boy, again, Ravens are going to be on the short week here. This Ravens team has problems. They have problems on the offensive line, and I understand, like, they've got injuries. They definitely have injuries. I mean, it, it goes beyond the running backs, obviously. And then they've lost, what, three running backs before they even played a down of football that counted this year. So I get it, and I, it's not, I'm not unsympathetic. But the game that I watched last night shows me against a team like the Raiders that Baltimore is not the contender that people think they are. They can't, they, they can't be. You cannot have a performance like that against a team like that, no disrespect to the Raiders, but against a team on their level. The Raiders are not Super Bowl contenders. They're not division contenders. They're not AFC contenders. They're not those things. So for Baltimore to go out and struggle so much against that team, like if, if the game was only 23 minutes long, Baltimore would be undefeated. But boy, the second half of that game was was awful it was just not good and you can't tell me that a the ravens are the contenders that people thought they were after a performance like that or b that the ravens are going to be competitive with the kansas city chiefs like let's remain in reality here obviously we're on the chiefs here on the road in baltimore to pick up the win over the ravens that'll drop the ravens to O and two on the line, Baltimore four-point dogs at home. Look, they were, uh, this number was minus three last night during the game. And I tweeted as that game ended, I said, go to your bookie right now 
and bet your next five years salary on Kansas City covering minus three. Because I figured the number would be closer to a touchdown when I woke up this morning. It's only minus four. I like him to win. That feels like a small price to pay on the Kansas City Chiefs. I don't think that number is a trap. I'm going to go with 75% of the public and lay the measly four points on Kansas City. Total in the game is 55 and a half. So this is actually the biggest total of the week. They both went over last week. They combined to be over their point totals by 16 and a half points, more than a touchdown on each side on average. I think I'm going to go over on this one. I see plenty of points in this game, more so coming from one side of the field. Let's take over 55 and a half points in Kansas City, Baltimore. Chiefs, 34 Ravens, 23. All right, folks, here we go. Platinum, gold, silver, and bronze picks for week two in the NFL. We're going to start with the bronze pick where I'm 1-0 both straight up and against the spread, but 0-1 oh on the totals. My bronze pick sees the Green Bay Packers at home taking on the Detroit Lions. And boy, Green Bay looked like there's no there's no pleasant way to sugarcoat scoring three points against anybody in this league like the best defenses in football you should still be able to score more than three points against especially if you're Aaron Rodgers especially if you're Devontae Adams especially if you're Aaron Jones and the Green Bay Packers they did not do that they looked awful from the first snap of that game that being said, they're taking on a division rival here, a team that they know exceptionally well, a team that has barely been able to touch them in their recent history, and a team that just lost arguably the anchor of their already weak secondary, that being Jeff Okuda at cornerback. He unfortunately ruptured his Achilles. He is done for the year. That is a significant, significant piece of Detroit's secondary that is not going to be out there. And when you're going to be taking on a pissed off Aaron Rodgers... You want every potential weapon on defense that you have. They're going to be without one of their biggest ones. I think this is Green Bay in a walk. I think Aaron Rodgers takes out his frustrations on these poor Detroit Lions. Give me Green Bay and I'm going to lay basically whatever I need to lay against the spread. Luckily, that number's only 10 and a half points. It's under two touchdowns. I'm definitely going to lay those points. Let's lay the 10 and a half on the Packers and assume that last week was this weird blip on the radar. Total in the game set at 48 points. It's possible that Green Bay gets close to this number on their own, but we're going to grab the over on this one for sure because I think Detroit with Jared Goff, I think their offense looked actually a little bit better than maybe I expected it to look. So I think they will certainly score some points. I mean, they got, they put up 33 last week against the Niners. I think the Niners are arguably a better defense, or they certainly were before the J Jason Barrett injury. We're going to go over 48 points in this one in Green Bay, Detroit. So we're going to go Green Bay straight up. We are laying minus 10 and a half on the Packers at home in a game that goes over 48 points. That is the bronze pick. Give me Green Bay 38, Detroit 14. Let's go to Cleveland now where the impressive Cleveland Browns get to take on the suddenly impressive Houston Texans. But that's again, that's another one of those measurements where it's like, were the Texans good or was the Jags defense just awful? And I think, you know, both can be true. Look, I've never felt like Tyrod Taylor is a bad quarterback. Maybe I'm giving the impression that I think he's bad. I don't think Tyrod Taylor is bad. I think he is an average to slightly below average NFL quarterback. That's just what I think he is. So that's why I didn't take them against the Jags. And that's why I'm not going to take them on the road against Cleveland. Cleveland showed me that they can hang, at the very least hang, with the best teams in the AFC. Maybe the best teams across the board in football. They're at least there. And that was without Odell Beckham. When they get Odell Beckham back, that only makes their offense more potent, obviously, this Browns team, I think, is going to make some noise this year. They're going to get back on the happy side of things this week at home against Houston. Let's take Cleveland to beat the Texans. On the line, Cleveland's laying 12 and a half points. Okay, guys, let's, let's calm down. And this is one of those lines that you look at and you go, wow, Vegas has no idea what they're doing, do they? Why do we give the odds makers so much power when they show up with a line, a line like this? Like Cleveland should be laying eight, maybe? eight and a half it just 12 and a half points makes absolutely no sense to me it's too many points i'm taking the texans because who knows the texans could upset them i don't think it's going to happen but they very well could 
So uh, the 12 and a half points is way too many. Total in the game set at 48. This is a pretty confident over as far as I'm concerned. I think this gets into the mid to high 50s. I got no problem going over on the 48. So we're going to go Brown straight up, but we're hedging our bets by taking Houston plus 12 and a half against the spread in a game that goes over 48 points. That is my silver pick. We're going to go Browns 34, Texans 23. Let's go to New York now where the Jets... Boy, they might still be the Jets. And again, shout out to my guy, Gary Vaynerchuk, because he put out a video on social media walking around downtown New York wearing his Jets gear and talking all kinds of smack about people that like, people say they're fans of teams, but they won't wear the colors after an, an, after you know a big loss or a loss that people don't think they should have had. And he was out there repping his gang green for the New York Jets. Shout out to my guy, Gary V. Uh, I don't think the Jets are going to have a fun time this week. I don't think either of these teams are quite as good as I thought they were coming out of the preseason. Like the Jets, I thought were one of the most improved teams in football. I thought there was a chance that they could beat Carolina. Didn't wind up happening. They also suffered a significant injury on the offensive line. That being Makai Becton. He sprained his MCL. That's a four to six week timetable for his return. Does not bode well against a Patriots team that I think is going to be hungry after knowing that they kind of gave that their opportunity anyway at winning that game in Miami away. Sorry, my apologies. That game was in New England. In any case, this is a Patriots team that knows they're better than the performance they gave last week. I think they're going to come out and show it in another division game here. Let's take the Patriots on the road in New York to beat the Jets. On the line, the Patriots are only laying five and a half points here as a road favorite. I'm going to join 70% of the public and I'm going to lay those points as well. Patriots minus five and a half. Total in the game set at 43. I don't think I can reasonably go over on this, even though the number's so small. I don't know what I'm going to get offensively out of the Jets. And if they're missing one of their good, big, young tackles, this Patriots pass rush could have a pretty impressive day. So I think I got to stay under on it because I may only see single digits from the Jets. In fact, that's what I'm going to predict. So we're going to stay under 43 points in New England, New York. Patriots straight up, we're going to hammer the Patriots minus five and a half against the spread in a game that stays under 43 points. That is my gold pick. Let's take the Patriots 30, Jets 6. And the platinum pick, that means where I'm 0-1 straight up and against the spread, but 1-0 and on the totals, sees the Tampa Bay Bucks at home in a division game against the Atlanta Falcons. By the way, in the silver pick and the gold pick, I'm 1-0 straight up and 1-0 against the spread, but 0-1 on the totals. Same across the board. Bucks got the job done with points at the end. Boy, did Dallas ever have a shot there at the end to win that game. Man, that was close. But you just see the look on, and I love, I love that the internet, the internet's a great place sometimes. They pointed it out immediately. Like when the Cowboys took the lead, then they immediately went to Tom Brady, and the look on Tom Brady's face was just like you thought <laughs> and and it's just it's so good that the internet picked up on that immediately uh look the bucks they got the benefit of the long week having played on thursday man did atlanta ever look bad against a team that i thought they could legitimately beat and vegas certainly did too because atlanta was the favorite by more than a field goal in that game at least when i took it this Atlanta team is is not good, man. The offense has problems, obviously. The defense still has problems carried over from last year. I don't see any way that Atlanta wins this game. So obviously we're on the Bucks here. Big time in their home opener, I believe. Let's take Tampa to beat Atlanta. Sorry, my mistake again is not Tampa's home opener. They played at home in week one. Boy, I, I'm great at getting things right. Anyway, where it's a division game, Tampa's laying 12 and a half points. This just, this smells like a backdoor cover. That's exactly what it smells like. I think Tampa is leading this game by like 16 late in the game. And boy, I think Atlanta just scores just late, just to barely, barely cover this number. But I think they're going to cover the plus 12 and a half. I'm going against 63% of the public in saying that, but I'm going to take the Falcons plus the 12 and a half points. Who knows? It's a division game. They could come up with the upset of upsets. I certainly don't think that's going to happen, but we're going to take Atlanta with the 12 and a half points. It's just too many for me.
Total in the game set at 52. The two teams went over under last week. Tampa going over, Atlanta staying under. They were in even money 18 and 18 last year against the totals to the over. My lean on this is to stay under because again, boy, you don't know what's going to happen really for that whole Falcons team. They're almost like the Chargers for me and that I can't really reliably bet on them. I think I'm going to stay under on this one. I'm going to trust my lean like I did in Denver Jacksonville. We're going to stay under 52 points here in Atlanta, Tampa. Tampa straight up, but we're kind of hedging a little bit, taking the Falcons plus the 12 and a half points in a game that stays under 52 points. That is my platinum pick. Let's take Bucks 31, Falcons 20. There you go, folks. The picks are in for week two of the 2021 NFL season. Apologies once again for the fridge in the background. It just has the best timing in the world. Oh, and I almost forgot comment of the week yes it is back for another season here comes the comment of the week from the week one episode comment of the week from the week one episode goes to my good friend and member of the progs community the blind canadian cat it goes to him and it says if football wasn't back before it is now as much as i don't like rooting for green bay it feels damn good to see that green and yellow on my youtube feed of course wearing the the packers colors Welcome back, Justin. Good luck on the picks. Good luck on the fantasy leagues and the pick and pools. And screw it all. Welcome back, football. Boy, cat, you put the hex on me, apparently, because I did bad basically in all of those things last week. But this is another week. Thank you so much. And yours is the comment of the week from the week one episode. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed the picks in week one. I'm really happy with the viewership. Let's see that even increase a little bit here in week two. That's it for me. Justin, Bridgewater's Finest on YouTube, Blockbuster underscore guy on Twitter, fueled as always by the incredible folks at Nerd Tees. I hope you like the shorter runtime this week. Huh? I told you we were going to get there. Folks, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you again in week three.